You know, I see from the, the announcement earlier this morning that there's, what, 17, 18 different groups have now conspired to join the Aspen Institute in this project. Uh, maybe we should just declare victory and go home and <laughs> talk about <laughs> something more important like the Red Sox cheating. <laughs> well, I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about. How about that? <laughs> well, can we get the Red Sox thrown out of the league? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, uh, I was talking to Jake and uh, Rick and Keel a little bit before, and uh, I think one of the things people don't realize is, uh, you know, sign stealing it's kind of been an, there's no rule against it. It's kind of an accepted part of our game. Um, and, uh, it, you know, if you're on second base and you're not trying to help your teammate, you're probably not trying to win. Um, I stole your line, Jake. Where are you? <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the issue is electronics. And uh, I think our sport, like a lot of businesses, has to find the right line of introducing technology into the game, but making sure that it, it, it doesn't alter the game in a way you don't intend. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's part of a broader sort of a professionalization of everything, right? Right, um, right. And that's, I mean, this is going to maybe seem impertinent, but uh, Project Play is about deprofessionalizing play. Right. About making it a more pure form of things. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you're the head of professional sports league, <laughs> right? Um, it, whose goal is sort of the opposite. Uh, the, what, what the Aspen Institute is trying to do with this is they're, they're insurrectionists. They're, they're at the gates, and, well, and you're the establishment. What well, the hell are you doing here? And well, I, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, when um, one of the things that occurred to me after I got elected, you know, people asking about me playing yeah. baseball, and, and I played all sports, but I um, only played baseball through Little League. I was actually the first commissioner who ever played Little League. I didn't know that until Steve Keener, who's in the back of the room, told me when I was visiting Williamsport. But um, it occurred to me when I got asked about playing that I thought I played a lot more baseball than my Little League experience would reflect. And when I thought back on it, um, it was days during the summer at a local park where kids would show up and we never had 18 kids. You know, we'd figure out some way to cover the field um, and some makeshift game that we'd play. And, but we played, we thought of that as baseball. And so when we started to think about the issue of youth participation, it seemed to us that one of the things we'd lost is that informal kind of play and interaction with our game um, that was so important to a lot of us when, when we were kids. So the, the, one of the sort of core principles of the Play Ball Initiative was to try to reintroduce this type of informal play where kids just get together, play the game. It's not 18 kids. They're not in uniform. There's no umpires. There's no parents. But they're playing baseball. And um, there's a lot of interest in that simpler form of play, not just with our sport, I think with sport in general out there. Um, the, one of the first places we talked about this issue was to the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Um, th that was three years ago. And each of the past three Augusts during play ball month, we've gone from, I think, 180 play ball events to 200 to 220. And these events are just one day community events. There's no uniforms, no, but kids get out there and play baseball related activities. And those community events, the introduction of kids to the game on an informal basis, teaching kids that they can play the game on an, uh, on an informal basis, we think is really important to our sport. Yeah. You know, in a way, we both grew up in small towns. Right. I, I'm in, from the Midwest, uh, not far from where the Field of Dreams is, and you, which is kind of a mythic idea. You grew up in James Fenimore Cooper country, which is another great American myth. And the, I, the danger I have when I think about this is that's an, a sort of an ideal form of, of that, which isn't possible. That's lost. Right. Uh, right. It's not, we're not, you're not going to recreate that. No, I, I, but I think that's why I said community-based events. I mean, literally, when I think of my childhood in the summer, you know, I have an sibling either side of me but close in age you know we'd get on bikes in the morning and go to a local park and you know we would resurface maybe at lunch unless somebody else let us go to their house for lunch and then come home for dinner and nobody ever worried about it my kids grew up dramatically different than that but I do think I do think even in a different environment 
that if you have community-based activity, those activities can be structured in a way uh, that promotes a form of informal play uh, that, that can exist in a more complicated society. Yeah. Yeah, we came home at night when the church bells rang. Right, <laughs> right, um, right. I, what, what's, what's in this for, for your, your professional entity? And what's in this for baseball? Well, um, let me answer that two ways. I think um, there's no doubt that from a business perspective, the single best way to create a fan, a baseball fan, is to have a kid play the game as a youngster, the re it, that, that's true of all sports. The research is just absolutely, you know, it, it, you can't deny it. I mean, it's just really strong indicator of, of who's going to be a fan. So, so that's the business justification. Um, secondly, you know, baseball has always had um, baseball as an institution, not the game, has always had a philanthropic bent to it. Um, I think that our owners and I know our players believe deeply that our game teaches values like teamwork and stick to itness, the ability to overcome failure that are really important in terms of producing, forget baseball players, really good adults. And um, I, it, there is no project that I've gone to the owners with that I've had more buy-in on than the idea that we ought to be more active in the youth space making sure that kids are playing baseball, but even if they're not playing baseball, that they're playing some sport. That's kind of a step away, right, cooperating with the other leagues because you're usually seen as uh, chasing the same elite athletes. Yeah, you know, I, th th that's true. Um, I, I do think that um, all of the other commissioners, and I, I hesitate to even come close to speaking for them, but we, we've all, we, the four of us have had conversations about the fact that um, there's currency to the idea that the best athlete, whether he turns out to be a hockey, a professional hockey player, a professional basketball player, a professional football player, a professional baseball player, is a kid that played multiple sports. Um, I, you know, I think that um, one of the most eloquent um, explanations uh, of this phenomenon. John Smoltz's induction speech into the Hall of Fame, um, he talked about the importance of kids playing multiple sports, how important it was to his development as a professional athlete. And you know, there's also a, there's, there's also a safety slash health overlay to it. Multiple sports, different sports, give body parts rest, um, which is a really important issue in today's youth participation market. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I, I live in Southern California, and baseball is played 10 months of the year or 11 months of the year there. I mean, when, in Iowa, when it started raining in the fall, you went inside and started playing basketball. Right, right. You know, or, or something Change else. with the seasons. And, and, and look, you know, we had a rash, um, kind of interesting, I guess it was two seasons ago, of particularly younger pitchers having Tommy John surgery. Um, you know, for obviously Tommy John surgery been going on a long, long time, but all of a sudden we were seeing it younger, younger, and um, it, you know the owners started asking, "What you know? What are we seeing here?" And we put together a group of orthopedists that looked at the issue, and they still have a really what I think will turn out to be a very significant cross organizational study going on, trying to figure out if there's training methods or use differences between organizations that make a difference. But the one thing they came back and told us right at the beginning, right at the beginning, is you are getting damaged goods in the draft. And you're getting damaged goods as a result of overuse of pitchers in particular when they're young. And so we started an initiative with USA Baseball called Pitch Smart that's designed to make sure coaches understand about youth, uh, use, what's an appropriate level of use, when pitchers should be start making particular kinds of pitches, but maybe most important, because a lot of these kids play in multiple leagues, the importance of keeping track of exactly how much a kid actually is pitching. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, that's a professionalization thing again. Right. You know, one of my favorite lines of all time from baseball is Willie Stargell. So he's telling his teammates, is, you know, remember what the umpire says. He doesn't say work ball. He says play ball. <laughs> right. You know, and, right. And to make it more recreational is the hardest thing possible, especially if the kid is good. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're the 
ones who are most likely to get hurt. You know, there is, there is informal play out there. Um, I, I mean, I think that, you know, people have in their heads that um, the growth in the sport, the growth in participation all involves organized play on teams. Um, and, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. We, we've made a huge effort in terms of trying to encourage youth participation. Um, last year, we were the only major sport that had increases in youth participation, both baseball and softball. Um, I can never remember. I think softball went up 8.1, 8, 8 baseball went up 7.7. 7. But maybe the more interesting number is casual play associated with our sport went up 18%. I take that as a really good sign for what that. What happened? Uh, look, I think a lot. I think it's like anything else. It's it's focus. It's investment. It's making great partnerships in the youth space. We when we got started on play ball, we didn't think we were going to take over the world. As a matter of fact, it would kind of be contrary to the idea of being against professionalizing right. sport. Right. Instead, what we tried to do is find great organizations that we could partner with and help make them more effective at what they were doing in the youth space. Um, I think Steve Keener in Little League is probably the best example. Um, they do a great job for us um, in the 8 to 12 space, but we, we, we had some unusual partners. I mentioned the U.S. Conference of Mayors. I think they've helped us. Um, and, you, you know, you, you just have to find partners um, that share the vision that the game can be played on an informal basis. Um, you have to invest with those partners. You have to stay focused on the need to provide access to kids. Um, and I think you can make a difference. Yeah, investment's the key though, right? Because we used to have in, in a more, less dense society, I mean, you could, you could go out and play all day. Now, my kids weren't allowed to go outside to cross the street. Uh, so you have to have some supervised place right. uh, and have it be frequent, have it be readily available. Uh, you know, kids have, have, have their calendars worked out. You know? Right. You know, our answer, and another answer on that is we've tried, probably the one I should have mentioned right after Little League is the Boys and Girls Club. Uh, you know, the Boys and Girls Club is baseball's official charity. You talk about a place where there is supervised activity. They run um, programs under the umbrella of reviving baseball in the inner cities for us all over the country. Um, most of those leagues really are in the informal category. You know, if they wear a uniform, it's a T-shirt. You know, it, it's, it really is informal play. But that is, you know, that's in that spot where you can make a difference with informal play, I believe. What's it cost? I mean, where does the money come from? Well, you know, we've, we've been really fortunate um, under one good thing about being a labor guy is you, you, you kind of know where all the money is hidden. And, um, you know, we had collected um, funds under the collective bargaining agreement um, from teams that, for example, overspent right. um, certain thresholds. And that tax money gets captured in central baseball. And in general, um, we have to have an agreement with the Players Association on how we're going to spend it. And in the last agreement, for better or for worse, we generated a significant amount of money. So Tony Clark and the Players Association got together with us uh, two years ago now. We took $30 million out of that tax money. So it's not coming from any club. It's not reducing what Central Baseball is distributing to the, to the clubs, but in partnership with the Players Association, we've been making investments um, exclusively in the youth space. We've built um, some elite play academies. We now have uh, six or seven of them in major league cities, two more on the, um, under construction right now. Um, that's at one end of the spectrum. We've done things like scholarship kids into elite play programs. You know, underprivileged kids don't have an opportunity to play travel baseball. We scholarship those kids into programs. Um, but it, all sorts of different things in, in the play area. So we've been lucky. We've had money to invest that's kind of not affecting our bottom line. Well, I have one more question. Uh, where where did you get the shoes? Well, I'll tell you about these shoes. Um, when um, our communications guy was telling me about today's event, he said, you know, they want you to wear sneakers with a suit. And I'm a little particular about how I dress. And I, I said, Pat, I'm not doing that. You know, I mean, I, there's no way I'm doing that. So um, while I was away last week and uh, while I was away, they got a hold of Kevin Plank in Under Armour. And when I got back to the office on uh, Tuesday morning, there were five 
pairs of Under Armors for me to choose from. And I thought since Kevin had been so nice about sending me five to choose from, I'd wear one of them today. So I'm wearing the right <laughs> brand, and there they are. Um, <laughs> is there a question? Yes. Oh, OK. So the question that we have is, baseball can be an expensive sport to play. How do you bring down, down that cost, especially as it comes to informal play? Yeah, you know, it's, um, this is a, th that's a really hard question, particularly given that I'm only going to get one because it is a real challenge for us. Um, we've approached it um, two different ways. Um, on the one hand, w w we've bought into the idea or accepted, maybe bought in is the wrong phrase, accepted the idea there is going to be expensive, high-end travel baseball that's going on. You're not going to change that. You can't change that piece of the world. And so we've responded that by that, to that by like scholarshiping kids into programs that, that we know are doing a great job with kids picking out programs and, and actually paying for them to participate. Um, the second thing we've done is the Urban Youth Academies that I mentioned. Um, ideally, we'll end up with thir at least 30 of them around the country. Um, they're free. Uh, we bear the entire cost, but it is high-end travel-based activity that often goes on in, in, in those academies. Each program is a little different with a different emphasis on you know, regular play as opposed to travel play. But in, in general, it's another way that we're trying to accept the notion there's going to be travel baseball and get, get underprivileged kids an opportunity to participate in that. Um, on the opposite end, um, we, we believe uh, that it's important to provide informal play opportunities that are not in the travel mode, and that's what play ball is really about, um, that kids can learn to play the game, actually excel at the game without being caught in that travel mode. We actually have time for one more question. <laughs> <laughs> it's rare that you get a short answer from me, so um, there you go. So our next question is, how do we get parents to understand multi-sport? You know, I think it's an education process. Um, I, I, and I think that the most persuasive argument, um, and, and it's why I mentioned John Smoltz, is that a lot of professional athletes actually believe the best way to become an elite athlete is to do multiple things as a kid. Make people understand that a lot of the players that are heroes to them, that they've watched on TV, were actually multi-sport athletes all the way up until they became professionals. So that's one argument. The second one is the one we referred to before. I think you need to make parents understand that um, you know it's great to pull little Johnny out of other sports and you know commit to a coach who says he's going to be the next Jake Peavy, even though the kid's only seven years old. But you need to understand that you may put it, be putting that kid at risk through overuse by making him do only one thing um, and focusing on one sport throughout the calendar year. It's actually the coaches you have to get to first, too, I think. Yeah, you know, but I, look, I, I think it's hard. Um, you know, competitive people are attracted to coaching. Um, I do think you can make coaches understand the argument that you're going to get a better athlete over the long haul if he's playing three sports. Um, to, to get them not to uh, try to get the very best athlete into their program, that, that's a hard, yeah. Yeah, that's a hard sell, I think.